Attorney Barb Levine is executive director of CAPS, which is working to change the prison parole system in Michigan. Prior to founding the group in 2000, she was a staff attorney in the state appellate defender's office, was a commissioner for the state Supreme Court, and taught law at Wayne State and the University of Toledo. Her BA degree and law degree are from the U of M. From the U of M. Goodness gracious. So blue. Yeah. Oh, How did we let you in that seat this week? <laughs> That's another story. Zoe, first question, please. Hi. Hi. Welcome. Thank so uh, you heard us talking about these uh, presumptive parole bills. This week you said that there was a lot of misinformation going around. I think that was your, your exact quote. Help us understand a little a bit about what you think is inaccurate about some of the things that have been said about the bills. This bill is actually a very modest bill that does nothing but enforce existing statute. In 1992, when the parole board was changed from corrections professionals to appointees, the legislature also enacted a requirement that there be parole guidelines to help this body structure its very, very broad discretion. So it said that if people score low risk on the parole guidelines, that they um, are supposed to be released when they've served their minimum sentence, unless there are substantial and compelling reasons not to release them. But the term substantial and compelling wasn't defined, and over the years the board has been pretty loose about using pretty subjective reasons for denying people who are have been determined to be low risk, but nonetheless denying them parole. All this bill would do is define what kinds of circumstances um, constitute substantial and compelling reasons. It, only applies to people who are at low risk. Will sex offenders be back on the streets? Everybody, no matter what their offense, becomes eligible for parole when they serve their minimum. And um, sex offenders, homicide offenders, obviously get longer sentences in the first instance because of the seriousness of their offense. But when they do their minimum time, the issue the issue isn't whether somebody committed a serious offense; it's whether they are a current risk. They serve the time for punishment for that offense. The issue then is, are they? currently at risk. And the fact is sex and homicide offenders have the lowest reoffense rates of any offense group. But there are a lot of people who believe this serious crime is what this is all about. If they did it once, they could do it again. But the data doesn't show that. This bill is very, very data driven. Sex offenders have a reoffense rate for another sex offense of about three or four percent. Here's your problem. You may have the data on your side, but you don't have the emotion. That's always a problem in criminal justice. That's always the problem. And that's why we work so hard at trying to educate people about what the research really says. And in really the war of words between you and Mr. Schutte, you are currently losing, yes? I don't know that that's true. We've got polling data that shows that 67% of voters support presumptive parole and want their legislators to vote for it. What do you think it is that, that you know, Schutte was able to get some of these sheriffs and prosecutors? Is, is that that you've had trouble uh, with messaging towards that group of people? Or, I mean, is there something about having them doing the jobs that they're doing that they're seeing a different side of it than, say, you are? I think they rely on the chief law enforcement officer for their information about what this bill will do. And unfortunately, um, he's not conveying accurate information about how our parole system actually He's works. Lying. I'm not in the business of accusing anybody of lying, but the information he's giving out about the parole system and about uh, what the bill will do is certainly not accurate. This will be, let's say, five years from now. Let's say the bill passes through and is signed by the governor and becomes effective. Five years from now, what do you think the landscape will look like on this issue? How much money will have been saved? How many people do you think probably will have been released from prison who would not have been if this law hadn't passed? It's not so much that people will be released who would not have been. It's that people won't spend an extra year or two or three well, and then but, be released. Okay, but so the Department is. of Corrections projects that the prison population will be reduced by 3,200 people in five years and a savings so of $75 like million dollars annually. 75 million dollars in. That can be then reinvested in communities in the sorts of, of services that actually are more effective at preventing crime. Now there are lawmakers who just wanted to insert the term nonviolent um, uh, in the bill. You know, not that uh, that it would presumptive parole would only apply for nonviolent offenders. What's what is the argument against that? Well, 
greatly reduces the number of people to whom it would apply and therefore reduces the, the effect of it. The fact is, it is true that the majority of prisoners in Michigan have committed a, a violent offense. Now, that can range from a bar fight to murder. It can range, you know, that's a very, very broad term that obviously covers a lot of behavior. But the point is, it's, the judge takes the offense into account when he or she sets the minimum sentence takes into account the person's prior record. The parole decision is supposed to be based on the person's current risk. And we all like say that we like evidence-based, research-driven decision-making, which is more accurate than seat-of-the-pants gut reactions. But <clears throat> And that's what this does. All it does is help the board structure its decision-making. The attorney general, uh, as we were talking about last week on the program, was talking about folks living in ivory towers, that it's easy for some people in communities that are safe to be okay with this legislation, even push for it, um, because it won't hurt them as much as communities that there is more violent crime. What do you, how do you respond to, to that statement Again, from the this, attorney general? It ignores the fact that the bill... A, only applies to people who are at low risk of reoffending. We're talking about people who uh, Department of Corrections figures show reoffend with a, a new assault of offense over the last three people released uh, in 09, 10, and 11 and have been out for at least three years, reoffend at a rate of three and a half to four and a half percent. I mean, we're talking about very low reoffense rates. So it's a misinterpretation of the bill to do all this fear mongering. But it's three or four percent too high. Well, you're never going to get to zero. We're talking about human nature. And the board is never going to be able to absolutely predict what's going to happen, in, you know, several years down the road in any given county. Do you have a case. reaction in place uh, for the first person who gets out early, who wouldn't have been let out, who does something horrendous, and somebody's going to stick a microphone in front of your face and saying, okay, Mrs. Levine, how do you explain what's happened? First of all, nobody gets out early. This is not early release. This is people Earlier getting... than they would have under the system now. Let's not parse oh. things too much. Well, they will have done their minimum sentence. Yeah, okay. People but get out all the time still, having done they their will have... Under the system we got now, they'd be keep kept in longer. You're saying no, let them out. They commit a terrible crime. Somebody's going to come to you and say this would not have happened. This person would still be behind bars. What do you say? I say that because you can't. I'd say a number of things. Unfortunately, yes, things will occasionally happen. It's almost predictable. But um, first of all, all the research shows there is no connection between keeping people longer and whether they reoffend. The public gets virtually taxpayers. Is that, virtually the, is that what you're going to say keeping... to a TV station with a microphone in front of you? No, what I'm also going to say is that there's simply, you can't decide to keep 100 people locked up because three or four or five of them might do something and you can't tell which one it is. You're talking about keeping thousands over time, people who would not commit any new offense. So in other words, you have up. to take a risk. This kind of decision making is about risk taking. And police officers make take risky decisions when they decide how to act out on the streets in a split second. The parole board's job is to make the best judgment it can on the information it has, and this bill helps them do exactly that. Mr. Shooter's that. comment about this being anti-cop motivated. When you heard that. I mean, what can you do but sort of roll your eyes? This has nothing to do with being anti-cop. It is pro good evidence-based decision-making. People get paroled. The parole board paroles about 10,000 people every year. People get paroled on or after their minimum sentence all the time. Are the right kind of people on our parole boards? You mentioned the boards were changed back in yeah. 1992. Would it be better if there were professional corrections officers on these boards? Not corrections officers, but corrections, necessarily, but corrections professionals with civil service protection. I think the civil service protection makes a lot of difference. You think they'd be better boards and be more likely to do what you would like this bill to force to be done? I think they'd feel less pressure and find it, right now it's always easier to say no. I think they'd feel somewhat more free to just follow the evidence and make the best decision. So part of the problem is just these boards are composed of the wrong people. Well, I'm not saying they're the wrong people. I'm answering your question that yes, I think if, if it was a civil service board, it but even if this bill passes, these boards still could make 
in your estimation, terrible decisions and not let these people out? What the bill does is it, it defines substantial and compelling reasons. So the board would, again, for people who have who score low risk on their guidelines. There's no room so, for judgment by the parole there's board There's absolutely itself. room for judgment. If there's any evidence that the person, objective, verifiable evidence that the person presents a risk that just didn't show up in a statistical risk assessment instrument, absolutely they can deny parole. This does not change when people become eligible. It doesn't prevent the board from exercising its discretion. What did you make of the Senate Republican response in caucus yesterday? Did you hear about it? I heard what you said. I haven't. I well, there's the truth. Okay. <laughs> right. Respond to the truth that you're not open to rave reviews. Our hope is, look, you know, the governor, Rep. Heisey, who sponsored the bill, 67 uh, House members who voted for it, all care deeply about public safety. And the hope is that, we certainly hope that the Senate, a majority of senators will also back away from the, all the rhetoric and look at the evidence. Chances of passage are what? Oh, I'm not in a position to assess that. 50-50? I think the chances are still very good. Ms. Lee, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Also, our thanks to our panelists. See you all next week right here on Off the Record.